Some of you may know that this 945 service that we do here at Lenexa is also what the folks get up at Legends in their 1020 service. They hear this same teaching, and it's going out live on the web as well. And then the guys up at Lansing get this on Sunday nights. So I need to say something mostly to those here at Lenexa, but secondarily to those up at Legends as well today. Here's the setting. Remember the first experience you had at Westside. Do you have that in your head? First time you visited at Westside. Hopefully it was a great experience. Hopefully people were friendly. We now have a problem that's a great problem, but we need your help with. The last several weeks, I have stood up to teach and seen families of four and five coming in a bit behind, but that happens when you're at the first time guest of a church, and not have a place to sit together. Not good. When people come in and can't even hang together in their first service, this is a problem. So I need your help. Those of you up at Speedway, we're beginning to run into a crowd space at the Twin 20 service as well. So here's what I need to do. For those of you here at Lenexa, listen close. If you have a middle school kid, and then this needs to be your service because the middle schoolers are meeting right across the way. This works well for you. It's designed for you. But if you are not having middle school kids right now and don't plan any in the next little bit, we need you to be missional. Can you help us by moving to 830 service or by moving to 5 o'clock service or by moving to the 9 o'clock service up at Legends? We're inviting you to be missional. We're inviting 200 of you, that's how many seats we need to gain, to say, you know what, I'll let some new folks have my seat. I can go to another service. Same service, same teaching, same stuff, same worship. I think you could check it out. Please consider doing that. Secondly, we're still having a struggle at 945 and at 11 here at Lenexa with the parking lot emptying out. We have a glorious, huge parking lot, but the wonderful city of Lenexa gave us one way on and off this property. And here's what we suffer from at the end of the service. You people are too nice. I mean, the people start emptying the lot, and the rows coming this way, one car will go, and then they'll stop and let somebody go the other way, and they'll stop and let somebody go the other way. So here's what's happening, particularly after 945 and 11. You come into the service as a guest. You have trouble sitting together as a family. You have a great experience, we hope, while you're here, and then you sit in the parking lot for 15 or 16 minutes to get out. No, no. We need help. What do we need? We need some folks who will stand there and work in the parking lot and do this. Whoa, you guys hold up. Come on, people. Whole row. Quit being Kansas nice. Let's go. Let's move. All right, all right. You guys stop. Whole row here. And you can get out of this parking lot of two to three minutes. If you can help us by moving to a different service or by being a parking lot Nazi, would you write parking on your Connect card today? We'll contact you. We need some help. Now, here's a great thing. There are churches across America that would love to be having space problems and parking problems right now. So turn to your neighbor and say, God's been good to us at Westside. Tell them. He has. We're grateful. Thank you for being part of what he's doing. Right now, let's get to the most important thing, and that is for us to listen for God to speak to us today. We've already done that through worship, through the baptism. I hope that you've come in saying, God, speak to me. We're in week seven of our series called Knowing Jesus. And if you've been here, you've already got the big idea. Write it in. You can start ahead of me. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him. You can be baptized and not know Jesus. You can come to church every week and not know Jesus. You can do good religious things and not know Jesus. The difference is about 18 inches. The difference between knowing about him in your mind and following him and surrendering to him in your heart. And that's what we've been focusing on out of John chapter 1 for seven weeks now. We'll wrap it up next week. Here's a secondary big idea. Here's a, a new thought to kind of sneak in. Knowing Jesus is how we know God, and it's also how we become who he created us to be. 
I want to be all God's created me to be. I don't want to finish and go, I left it on the shelf. I don't want to finish and say, I left it on the playing field. I want to go all in. I want to say, I left it all there, not on the bench, not in the stands, not in reserve. I went after it. And knowing Jesus is how we do that. Today, our topic is Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. And we're going to look at it three different ways. Number one, we need to ask, is Jesus the Messiah? It starts with the question. Now, I personally believe the whole world is looking for a Savior. We're looking for help. We're looking for somebody to deliver us. We're looking for somebody to conquer the stuff we can't conquer. We all need to be rescued from different things at different times. We're looking for a Savior. And I find that this is the case. Write it in. It's a good thing to ask Jesus, who are you? It's a good thing. Now, I grew up in a church in a very fundamental conservative home and church where you didn't question mama, you didn't question daddy, you didn't question church, and you sure didn't question God. I can't remember how many times I was told, because I said so, because that's the way the church does it, because that's what God says, that's who God is. And I was never allowed to ask questions about God. So I saved them up for 18 years, and when I went off to college, guess what I did? I spent three years asking questions about God. Hey, parents of teenagers, look this way for a minute. Don't do that to your kids. Make it okay for your kids to ask questions. Make it okay for them to walk in and say anything they need to say to you about any subject. Wow, you don't ever want to say to your kids, well, we don't talk about that. Or you don't want to say to your kids, well, we don't question that. Of course we question it. They've got questions. And here's a hint. If they're not talking to you about spiritual things, there's one of two reasons. A, they don't think you know anything about it. Or B, you've sent the signal that that's a subject that is off limits. People naturally talk about spiritual things. That's who we are. It's okay to ask questions. God is not put off by our questions. In fact, here's God's response to our questions. Bring them on. Ask them. I'm not afraid of them. Look at what the Scripture says. This is an interesting thing. It tells us literally, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. What is the deal? We need to realize everybody's trying to put God in some category. Everybody's trying to decide what to do with Jesus. There are four options in this passage. In John chapter 1, we literally read, they come to John the Baptist and they're saying, who are you? Are you the Messiah? John says no. Are you a prophet? No. Are you a teacher? No. Well, what are you? I'm the one that points to the one who is the Messiah. Many, many times people are asking these things about Jesus. Write them in your notes. Are you a prophet? A lot of religions recognize Jesus as a prophet. This one's interesting to me. Did you know Islam says Jesus is a prophet of God? And I want to just go, really? Would a prophet lie to you? Because Jesus said he's God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and you don't go to my Father except through me. You guys don't believe that. How can he be a prophet? He's more than a prophet, but we need to ask the question. Some ask, are you a teacher? I hear a lot of folks say, I like what Jesus talks about. In fact, I like Jesus okay. I just don't like his church much. By the way, church, that's because we've given them a bad taste of who we are. That's not on them. That's on us. Maybe the question is, are you a messenger from God? That's what they asked in John chapter 1. Are you a messenger from God? But the real question is the one we dealt with in week 1 of this series back on January 8th. Are you God? Because the answer is yes. Yes. It's okay to ask, is Jesus the Messiah? The Jews of Jesus' day largely rejected him because they were looking for a military Messiah. They wanted somebody to overthrow Rome and set them free. Some of us have rejected Jesus because we're looking for a financial Messiah, and so far he hasn't rescued our checkbook. Or we're looking for a fix-everything-about-me Messiah, and so far we've still got struggles. People reject Jesus for a lot of things, but we've got to ask the question, are 
you the Messiah. It begins with the question. Look at what Jesus said. He literally said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Here's what he says. You got a question? Bring it. You want to talk? Bring it. You want to discuss? Bring it. You want to complain? Bring it. He's not afraid of our questions. In fact, he's just plain not afraid of us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's not afraid of you and I'm not either. Tell him. He's not, me either, some of you just lied. <laughs> we start by asking, is Jesus the Messiah? Secondly, we need to progress, not just from asking the question, but to finding an answer to the question. The point is not to have questions. The point is take your questions and turn them into a pursuit of God so you can get to this second place, which is you want to know that Jesus is the Messiah. Write that in your notes. You want to know he is the Messiah. I believe we can know that. In fact, the Scripture makes it infinitely clear. Messiah is a very specific word in the Bible. Old Testament, slightly different from New Testament. In the Old Testament, it is the word Messiah or Meshua, as it is later translated. And it literally means anointed one. Write that in your notes. It literally means anointed one. Somebody God has anointed. He's equipped. He's made them able to do a specific task. A Meshua, a Messiah. That's the idea. In the New Testament, the Greek, based on the same word, is Messiah. And it literally means chosen one. So add that to it. It's somebody who's chosen to do a specific task. That's what a Messiah is. The historical meaning then is a deliverer or a savior. We need a Messiah means we need a deliverer. We need somebody that's so anointed and so set apart by God and so chosen that they can save us, that they can deliver us. That is the idea. By the way, it's interesting to me that the Meshua, Old Testament word, later becomes Joshua, which later becomes the word Joshua, the equivalent of which is Jesus in the Greek. Even his name says, I am the Messiah. You got to know that I am the Messiah. It's not something we have to wonder about. We ask, yes, but we move to the place where we know that is the case. Third point, though, is where we want to end up. Take my questions and ask them, pursue them. Know that he's the Messiah. Here's the third one. It's for everybody that's here today. I want to live like he's the Messiah. I want to live like I have a deliverer, like I have a rescuer, like I have a savior. Now, I realize when I speak on any given weekend, there are at least two crowds that are present. There's the crowd that has not yet put their faith in Christ. They're checking it out. They're looking around. They're, they're seeing about this God thing, but they haven't settled it. And then there's the crowd that has trusted Jesus and has put their faith in him, but they're still going after him as well. Listen close. Both crowds need a Messiah. Both crowds need a Savior. If you're in that first crowd, here's the good news. Jesus saves us in two specific ways. First, he saves us from our sin. That's part of what Messiah means. He will deliver us. He will rescue us. He will save us from our sin. I love the fact from that from the first time the news is spread about Jesus, the angel comes and talks to Mary, the mother of Jesus, who has never been with a man and yet she's going to be pregnant by the way that's been claimed many times done once <laughs> some of you're going to get that halfway through lunch <laughs> from the very moment that jesus is mentioned check it out the angel says to mary you are to give him the name jesus remember the name means joshua or meshua messiah you will give him the name messiah for he will save his people from their sins. Here's the deal. Every person in the world makes mistakes. We're all sinners. All of us. Some of us acknowledge it, some don't. 
We're all sinners. We've all blown it. And since we've blown it, we all need a Savior. We all need a rescuer. You got two choices in terms of when you get to heaven. You can either go with the, I'm good enough that I think my good's going to overcome my bad idea. Now, can I stop right there? I know you guys don't go with that one. (laughs) Don't go with that one. Because the scripture says we've all blown it and we all fall short of God's standard. I can either go with the, I'll just think I'll make it on my own. Or I can go with the, no, wait a minute. Somebody else has paid my price and paid my penalty and taken my place. And I'm good now. I'm going with this one. Because scripture says that Jesus, while he had never sinned, died for me because I am a sinner. And that Jesus took my place, my punishment. He raised his hand and said, I'll do, I'll do the time for Dan's crime. I'm in. I'll take it. He said, I'll be Dan's savior if Dan will accept me. And to all of us, he is saying, do you need a deliverer? The answer is yes. Now, to those of you sitting there thinking right now, no, I'm really in pretty good shape. Hang on. Your day's coming. Hang on. There'll be a moment where you're going to need a Savior, and Jesus is the one. He will save you from your sin. That's the great news. The first part of a Messiah is he saves us from our sin. But here's the second part. It applies to all of us. It especially applies, listen, to those who have already accepted Christ and know that he's forgiven their sin. You still need to be saved. What from? Jesus will save me from myself. And for some of us, the self part is a tougher saving than the sin part. If you have been alive on this planet yesterday, you had to see some coverage or some news about the Whitney Houston funeral. Did you see it? CNN gave four hours of live coverage to this funeral. They don't do four hours of live coverage when a president dies. So it's an amazing thing. And I don't know what your emotional response is. Y'all do know what I'm talking about, right? You've been on planet Earth the last week. You know that one of the greatest singers, if not the greatest female singer of our time, passed this past week. Amazing talent. Amazing voice. Gift from God. I've gone through some interesting set of emotions on that. I mean, when she first passed and everybody was into, oh, how great she was and oh, how awesome she was, I wanted somebody to say, wait a minute. She made some choices that really wrecked her life. Will somebody say that? And then later in the week, I thought, man, that's too harsh. That's too harsh. Wait a minute. She was somebody's daughter. She was somebody's sister. She was somebody's mama. Dan, can you not have some compassion? And and I kind of worked through that. But I was reminded in the news coverage yesterday of a Barbara Walters interview that I actually saw in 2009 when when the when the newscaster mentioned it, my mind went straight back. In that interview, Whitney Houston admitted so many of her struggles. She admitted she struggled with the demon of alcoholism. She admitted that she struggled with the demon of drug abuse. She admitted that she'd struggled with, with all kinds of demons from a really bad marriage. She admitted that she didn't think she was pretty. Can you imagine that woman not knowing she's beautiful? Wow. Wow. She didn't even know if she really had a voice and a gift from God. Those were her demons. And in the middle of that interview, Barbara Walters looked at her and said, Well, Whitney, of all of those, which is your greatest demon? And she said, Oh, I haven't mentioned my greatest demon. My greatest demon is me. I could raise my hand right here. It's amazing to me how often we're willing to trust Jesus to save us from our sin and to settle our eternity, but we aren't willing to trust him to deliver us from ourselves. My biggest problem is me, and everywhere I go, I'm there. (laughs) It's me. I mean, when you're struggling in your relationships at work and you're struggling at home and you're struggling with your friends, what's the common thread? It's here. It's here. And while Whitney clearly knew Jesus, and that funeral clearly pointed people to Jesus, I was amazed at how much he was talked about. The second clear reality is she never quite trusted Jesus 
to save her from herself. We all need a Savior. Paul, the guy who wrote half the New Testament, I believe was the most impressive Christ follower of the first century. He said it this way, Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. I'm chief. My biggest problem is me. That's what Paul is saying. And everybody who knows Paul is going, "Uh uh-huh. Yes, it is. And when you and I get honest enough to say that my biggest problem is me, everybody else in our life is going, thank you, Jesus. He's finally getting it. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. He needs a Savior. He needs a Messiah. Here's the bad news and the good news. Bad news. We all need a Savior. Good news. His name is Jesus. And he's available. You're not going to believe it looking at me now, but I was a lifeguard in high school. (laughs) And in two years of being a lifeguard, which, by the way, is a really cool job. I mean, you get paid for sitting up on a tower and being in charge. It's pretty cool. In two years of being a lifeguard, I had to go into the pool to pull somebody out twice, and it was on the same day. And the same group of kids. There were a group of middle schoolers in the pool that day. And these middle schoolers decided that every time I, the lifeguard, looked the other direction, they would do something you weren't supposed to do in the pool. And what they were doing was getting back from the diving board, running fast, and trying to do as many flips as they could. They started doing front flips, which is allowed off a diving board in a pool, but then they wanted to do back flips, which are not allowed. Because when you go off a board and flip backwards, your head is spinning back towards the board. Not a good plan. And two different kids in this group managed to go off the board to do a front flip and to come back and to whack their head on the back of the board. And a middle school kid that's knocked out cold does not float. And when I went in the first time, it scared the hooey out of me getting that kid out. But when the middle schoolers went back and the second one did it, I'm thinking, dear God, these people need saving. (laughs) In fact, I've now concluded all middle schoolers need saving. (laughs) You know what the reality is? There's some 45-year-old middle schoolers here today who still think I can walk the edge and I can backflip my way through life and I can pull it off because I'm hot. I'm good. I got it together. You never outgrow your need for a Savior. From your sin, you bet. Settle eternity, get it done. It's huge. But from yourself, always. Always. We're going to pray together in a minute, and I'm going to lead us in two specific prayers today. Listen close. The first prayer is for the people in the room in that first group that have not yet decided that Jesus is the Savior. I believe he is. I encourage you to decide that he is and to ask him to forgive your sin and come into your life. But the second prayer today is for the rest of us, and it's this. Jesus, I've settled that you're my Savior from my sin, but I still struggle with me. And I need you to save me from me today, from my attitude, from my actions, from my habits, from me. We're going to pray both of those prayers today. You can pray silently as I pray them out loud. And then the band's going to come out and lead us back to that Jesus is the Messiah idea. Up at Legends, Pastor Brad's going to lead this prayer. Up at, uh, up at Lansing, Pastor John's going to do it online right now. Nick's going to do it. And you can click that button online that says live prayer and pray with somebody in this exact moment. To talk about Jesus as Messiah without allowing those who don't yet know him to know him and without letting those who do know him but are still running their lives to ask him to save them from themselves would be so wrong. So let's pray together right now. Would you join me in this prayer? For the first group, those who need to settle the issue 
of Jesus being the Savior from sin. You could pray this prayer with me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've done a lot wrong. I'm sorry for what I've done. I ask you to forgive me. I need a Messiah. I need a Savior from my sin. So would you come into my life? I believe in you. I trust in you. I give myself to you. I want to be like you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me from my sin. For those that have already prayed that prayer, but you need to be saved from yourself, you could pray this prayer with me. Jesus, thank you that you've already forgiven me. Thank you for already saving me from my sin. But Lord, I need help. I need saving from me. From my habits, Lord. From my attitudes. From me being in charge, God. Forgive me for trying to do it on my own. I ask you to save me from me today. Be my Messiah. Be my deliverer. I trust you, Jesus. I love you. Amen.